Oliver's running for mayor. Can you talk about how that storyline's coming along? And Well, there's a photo that exists for the next episode where we see him behind a podium. Um, so, I mean, it, it's, it's weird to... It's actually very atypical for our show to announce something in an episode and then just sort of leave it dormant for an episode, which we did this week because so many other things were going on. But it has been... Um, it has been something that I've, I've very much enjoyed. There are two aspects of Oliver's character this year. Um, well, actually, probably three. I mean, he, he's, a, he's a different type of person out in the field. He's a different uh, type of person in the political arena. And then there's a third storyline that we're going to explore in the first third of the year that's also different. So being almost 80 episodes into a show, it's exciting to play different things and uh, I like Oliver the politician and I also like any time we can do something that weaves naturally into the canon of the Green Arrow character. How about the family reaction to the news? <laughs> Slight, they're slightly incredulous. Um, he hasn't talked to Lance about it yet, has he? Mm-mm. No. Okay. So everyone has their sort of <laughs> so everyone has their sort of everyone has their various reactions and uh, one of the things once the team figures this out, Oliver actually says, you know, I gotta talk to I gotta talk to Lance, to which Laurel responds, not to give too much away. Uh, maybe don't bring that up with him and you know. I'm just like, well, I, I we need the SCPD. So it's uh, it's an Oliver Queen that has to work with people and uh, that's it's exciting. You said that uh, you wanted to bring in more of the Green Arrow comic. We talked to the uh, costume designer. She said it was your idea to leave the sleeves off of the new costume this season. That was my idea. I was shooting turtles in Manhattan, mm-hmm. and they sent me a they sent me a sketch. Not a sketch. They actually sent me um, Simon Burnett, my stunt double, in the suit, and then a various mock-up of the suit. And so I look at it, and I'm like, okay, it's great, but it's just not different enough. If we're going to say that it's going to be different, it has to be different. We have to think outside the box. We have to take away the hood, or we have to make the jacket black, or we have to take the sleeves off. And they're like, well, take the sleeves off? You're done. <laughs> and I swear to God, it was done that day. They took the sleeves off. Um, so there was that. And then uh, we actually went and did a photo shoot before the season, which is what we see on the poster, um, to make sure that it fit for the Comic-Con reveal. And I also had the idea of making sure that the fletches on the arrows were different and just that there were more pops of green. The only real thing that we left, aside from the boots, is Greg Berlanti wanted to leave the original mask because it was a gift from Barry Allen. We like that we like that little trinket in the story. How does the run for mayor affect Oliver's relationship with the city? Oh, she's very supportive of it. Um, it's, uh, it's, it, it galvanizes their relationship, and uh, it actually really works well for his relationship with, uh, with Thea as well, because she becomes involved in his campaign. And... Um, I don't know, it, it allows us to begin to establish a, uh, an interesting dynamic between Oliver and Damien Dark, because while the dynamic will continue to exist between the Green Arrow and Damien Dark, as we saw, uh, as we saw in the second episode this year, um, Dark does not react too kindly to people running for mayor. He doesn't want anyone to be mayor. He doesn't want any galvanizing force or goodness in the city. So this puts puts everyone at odds. Are we going to be seeing Oliver fighting as Oliver and not so much the Green Arrow because of this? Uh, fighting as Oliver? Not so much. Um, uh, but there's, a, there's an interesting cat and mouse game that, that is, a, is a real focal point of our first nine episodes. Um, you know, obviously every, every one of our seasons breaks down to you know, episode one to nine is normally it's establishing the big bad, and that's not the case this year. Episode one to nine really takes us on an interesting journey. Episode ten to through sixteen, when we again take another break, kind of the mini midwinter finale, and then we get into our end game. So um, there is an interesting cat and mouse game developing between Oliver and Damien. Yeah. Um, 
Yes. Give your fans a heart attack when you almost propose to Felicity, only to have that interruption. Uh, the last we saw the engagement mm -hmm. ring, it is in a bowl in their yes. apartment. Uh, when is that Stupidest ring? Stupidest place to keep it. <laughs> <laughs> when is that ring going to be making another appearance? Sometime during the season. Sometime during the Some, first half? Sometime the during the season. Mm -hmm. Do you, you think that if Oliver starts to pull well, that there is kind of a moral and ethical responsibility that he has to let people know what's going on in his other life? Well, that's an interesting question. Uh, I think that that the whole idea of running for mayor, um, intrinsic in it, is an idea that, that we are going to separate the Oliver Queen and the Green Arrow character because Oliver Queen, as a man representing the city, can do things that the Green Arrow can't. And he can... I mean, the Green Arrow can uh, can take down the city's criminals, but he can't he can't rally a crowd uh, with a speech, which is one of the things that I've really enjoyed doing this year. I've had more speeches this year, both good and bad, than I've probably had in the first three seasons combined. So no, we definitely want to keep those two things separate. With Sarah's resurrection, can you talk about Constantine and how Oliver gets Constantine to show up? Uh. First of all, Matt Ryan was, he was really fantastic on the show. He, uh, the first scene that we shot together, we did the first take, and, and then he just starts jumping up and down and going, I gotta find him again, I gotta find him again, I gotta find him again, I gotta find him again. Because he hadn't played the character, and I mean, I always remember, uh, the first episode of every year for me, the first day, I'm just like, I was the worst I've ever been, and then you go back and you see it, and it's fine, so he was finding it, but, um, we weave Matt in very nicely, and the Constantine character in very nicely. I think that with keeping within the framework of our show, um, we lend ourselves to the things that makes Constantine fun as a character. You know, yeah. we talked with Grant Gus. <laughs> yep. When we talked with Grant Gus the other day, um, we talked about the grave scene and that you guys still don't really know who could be buried in there. What was your reaction when you found out that there is a looming death this season and do you have any suspicions? Well, of course I have suspicions. <laughs> of course. Um, I mean, that is the... I, I'm extremely proud of our first nine episodes. I think that they're, I think that they're excellent. I think that... Um, that there wasn't, there's not one real moment um, or one huge swerve in the first nine episodes, like there have been in almost the first three seasons, whether it was a reveal or, or whether it was someone being alive that you thought was dead, in, this, in that case, Slade Wilson, which is more, hap is more commonplace on the show now, but wasn't so much back then. Um, the only time that I was really cracked over the head was reading the, the script of 401 and seeing the flash forward. Um, I mean, one of my favorite shows of all time is, is Lost, and it, my favorite episode ever is when they flash forward for the first time. So for us to do that um, in episode 401 is, uh, I mean, that was just, that was very cool. Do you think they could really kill off Felicity? The, they can kill off anyone. You can kill off anyone. Modern television has proven to us that you can literally kill off anyone. Can you talk a little bit about uh, the episode you guys did with uh, Lexi Alexander? Uh, she directed the upcoming episode. Yes, she did. Now, it, it was it was a very strange situation because because of some various production things, principally Matt Ryan's availability because he was heading to Broadway, we actually, for the first time in the history of the show, had to flip episodes. So he's 405, she was 404. We actually shot 405 <laughs> first and then went on to 404 with her. Um, Lexi had wonderful notes, and uh, you know, Oliver and Quinton have some scenes in Lexi's episode that's airing on Wednesday. Might be so, it's certainly some of my favorite stuff, uh, not only this year but in the entirety of the show between Oliver and Quinton. And uh, Lexi was just there for great notes, and she was present when she needed to be, and she backed away when she needed to be as well. I really enjoyed working with her. Ray has been posing dead for a, a good amount of time, and but obviously he's coming back in a few weeks. What can you say about Oliver's reaction to his return? And you know, I can't really say anything for the following reasons. It's the weird. It's the weirdest thing. It's it's an incredibly unique situation with Legends of Tomorrow, in that because of the world that we live in, and because we have fine folks like yourselves covering the show, and because it is the priority of the network that we air on to promote Legends as a mid-season thing, 
everyone knows that Brandon Routh and Katie Lotz <laughs> and you know there's going to be Arthur Darvel and there's going to be Vandal Savage Vandal Savage by the way is a spectacular character um, but to me they're still dead <laughs> they're still dead so in, until they until they pop back up in our universe I think that it warrants keeping a little bit of mystery James talked about um, a stunt in his episode that James took, Bamford yeah, yeah that took him 20 years to do on screen it's in act 5 yes, it is. I'm assuming it involves you it How does not you... no okay well were you there for it I was not okay well, what was it like having him as a I watched friend? it today and I watched James Bamford's episode today and um uh, one of the things that has always riled me up about the show is I know that we do things, stunts-wise, but I don't always see them on screen because there's so much stuff to pack in that the stunt sequences especially, they tend to fall into the hands of the editor, which is not necessarily a bad thing, but they tend to be cut a little bit more than I would like them to be. James always wants a stunt and a sequence to run on a through line and for people to be able to see it so that you can put intention behind the action otherwise you're just swinging your fists around <laughs> and there is more the the stunt sequences in James's episode are the most uh, graphic well choreographed uh, superbly shot and put together sequences that we've ever done on the show um, aside from all that which seemed like it was a given he was an incredible director. He was prepared without being rigid. Um, he gave excellent notes. He had a nice command of the crew, and uh, I, I hope that he does dozens more. Can we know we that about? Donna Smoke is in the episode you're filming now, and she's appeared before. Can we talk about what her dynamic with Oliver is like now that he's dating closely? It's great. <laughs> it's really good, actually. Uh, I. Uh, I, when she first appears, and I believe she appears in, my goodness, uh, either episode uh, six, episode six, um, I had always Im imagined that Oliver and her had been speaking mm -hmm. in the time between they, them leaving together at the end of season three, the, them being Oliver and Felicity. And then returning to Star City, or not returning to Star City, returning to sort of the, the suburbs. Mm -hmm. um, I I had always imagined that Oliver in his, in his nice, easygoing state would have a dialogue with, with, uh, with Donna Smoke, which is proven correct and, and leads to some funny moments. But the dynamic between the two of them is excellent. What can you talk about uh, the crossover episode that we have this year, and how does it compare to last year's? Well, last year was designed... Uh, I think we spoke about this briefly. Last year was designed that if you were a fan of one show or a fan of the other show, you could enjoy 108 of Flash and 308 of Arrow uh, independent of one another. It's not the case this year. They are, if, if you put them back to back on one night, they would run like one two hour episode of television. Um, in fact, most of the Flash episode takes place in Star City and most of the Arrow episode takes place in Central City. Um, we, have a, uh, we have a common villain, uh, which was not the case last year. Um, and, and just in general, we've done an excellent job of weaving not just two shows, but, but three shows together. Uh, as always, it was, it was logistically challenging, but um, I think I think when they're finished, whenever that is, because there's <laughs> little pieces here and there to grab, um, I, I think that these two episodes, crossover episodes, um, standing together will probably be, in my mind, the, the, the pinnacle achievement for both shows. I really think so. I mean, it's, there was, you know, when we started shooting Arrow, there was just me, right? And then when they started Flash, it was just Barry, and then obviously, you know, the worlds expand. We shot a scene, possibly last week, possibly the week before, it could have been last <laughs> month, I'm not entirely sure. But it had like nine superheroes in it, right? Wow. Nine people with either powers or super suits. And <laughs> it, was a, it was an amazing thing to look at, to just sort of look out over the scene and see the world that has been built over the course of plus years. 
in this is last night's episode, um, Hive was brought up. Diggle and Oliver kind of came together on that. Can you kind of preview what their take's going to be on Hive over the next couple episodes? Well, it, it you know, it, it varies. There, there's, a, there's a variable in place that, that you know, takes things to another level for... Um, for Diggle's character, but also for, you know, Oliver has one set of, uh, Oliver has one viewpoint on Hive, and Diggle has another much more personal viewpoint on Hive. And while the two of them continue to work together, I think we're over the hump of what happened, uh, you know, at the end of season three, Lila. Um, they're not at odds in terms of being against one another, but their viewpoints on how to deal with Hive and and the strategy just really come to a head. In the first nine episodes, is there any sort of fear within Oliver that Damien could find out his true identity and strike at the people who are important to him? And this is last last question. Sure. Uh, yes, uh, but and this is an important. It's it's a good thing to end on. Of course, there's of course there's a fear of that. But one of the things that Oliver has learned to do this year is trust that everyone on the team um, you know Laurel and Thea and Diggle and Felicity um, can handle themselves and that they wouldn't be doing what they were doing if if there's even a line I wouldn't be doing this if you know if I didn't think that I was going to end up in the crosshairs of a supervillain every once in a while and so that's the sort of the growth point. One of the growth points for my character this year is, okay, if you guys are in, you guys are in, and I'm going to trust that you can handle yourselves. Even though, you know, one of them is my sister, and of course, the other two are, are are lifelong friends and people that I care about and love, and and another one is someone that I'm in love with and actively dating and considering proposing to. So that is a growth point. 